Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. We've got a triple feature Wyron today, and just to answer a few people's questions, what does Wyron stand for? It's Would You Rock or Not? But today I thought we'd check out three guitars that I saved in my Wyron list that have long since sold, but were pretty cool anyway, so let's check them out. Two of these guitars today come from Rumble Seat Music in Nashville, Tennessee. Kind of to show them that there's no hard feelings here. <laughs> so this has to be the most fantastic SG I've ever seen. It's highly modified, but kind of in a cool Billy Gibbons way. Because you look right here, you've got the orange pin striping around the control cavity. And I'm not normally one that's real big on the pin striping vibe. Because here's the Billy Gibbons Custom Shop pinstripe job. It doesn't really do anything for me on a Les Paul, but it does have a certain cool factor because Gibbons did it. But I think it's the color that really makes me appreciate this one. That bright orange with the red, with the yellows. It kind of gives me a Native American theme, but I kind of get those vibes from this symbol right here. But from this angle here, you can kind of see some interesting stuff too. So this is not just yellow paint. It's been pinstriped over top of that. You couldn't see that in the previous angle, but it's like a yellow plastic pick guard. It almost kind of looks like a tweed amp covering, but is it like a cloth or something that they hardened and then screwed to it? Cause you can see it's some sort of like a pick guard material maybe because of these mounting screws right here. <laughs> I'm just realizing this for the first time. So they probably had to cut the original pick guard down to size to make way for this other stuff. So if you were to take those off, this would look real goofy unless it's actually just a painted part of the original pick guard. Take a look at our Vibrola tailpiece right here too. They also custom etch engraved over top of the Gibson wording. But it doesn't look like they did that for the pickups or anything. So I've known about this one for, let's see, how long has it been? Yeah, about a year that they listed this one. But this is the first time I'm actually realizing this. I thought that was just more paint job. But it looks like at one point in time, there might have been like a two slider switch system right there. Maybe for like in and out of phase of the pickups or whatever pickups used to be in there. Or like an on off switch. It could have been a bunch of stuff. It's a little bit unclear to me though if those are actually little yellow switches right there or if that's just evidence of a previous modification and, and there's like a yellow backing plate underneath it. And the whole photo shoot of this with that old style blanket, it really just adds to the whole vibe of this instrument. But now let's take a look at that headstock because they didn't really do anything too special here on the fretboard. At first glance, you might be a little bit overwhelmed. What has actually happened here? Is there custom inlays? No, once again, that's pinstriping. So they did a little bracket right here, another bracket on the side. You've got like this wheat stack, almost kind of looks like a Firebird emblem right there. And unfortunately, they covered over the wheat stack, crown, frog, whatever you want to call it, with some more of this. That almost kind of looks like a flower to me. But I love the way that the finish is aged on this thing. So what stopped me from buying this example to review and document? Because it is pretty cool. It was mainly the price on this one, 7850 bucks. I'm sure it's worth it to somebody because they'll fall in love with it. And obviously they did because this is since sold. But this shop was definitely asking a premium for this piece because our estimated value for a guitar from this era, according to Reverb anywhere, is between three to five and a half thousand. And specs in year quite literally mean everything when it comes to one of these guys. So it looks like we can get a clean one from another reputable dealer today for about eight and a half thousand dollars, which that's definitely top, top, top value. But you get what you pay for when it comes to these things. But here's one from a private seller that's used, seems to be in pretty clean shape for about six and a half. So, I mean, they weren't asking for a crazy premium or anything. So if you love those modifications, maybe it was worth it for them because this one actually had swapped out tuners. Unfortunately, I've only got three photos to go off of this one, so I can't determine the originality of it. But it was definitely a cool piece. And as a bonus feature here, it comes from the personal collection of Joe Bonamassa. I would love to hear his story of how he found that guitar because he usually has some nice stories behind his finds because he goes on those guitar safaris as he calls them. Next up here, we have one for you bass lovers. It's also from Rumble Seat Music, but this one is supposedly the only 12 string bass that Gibson has ever made. That's right, a 12 string bass. Let's check it out. So here it is. It's kind of a double cutaway shape, but it has a comfort cut right there to make it easier to play. It looks like we've got a PRS styled cutaway right there to access the upper frets. 
But yeah, why on earth do you need a 12 string bass? And why does it still look like a four string bass? And why is the neck not like this long? It's because it's kind of like a 12 string guitar, but you have another pairing within it. So that's three strings right here, three strings there, three there, three there. So you're just playing a bunch of octaves. That's a good way to generalize it anyways. You can do many different things on these. But it looks like two pickups, standard bridge that they use on these guys. One, two, three, uh, <laughs> four. It's funny how many times you look at these listings and don't even notice something like a missing knob. <laughs> and on top of all that, it's a golden color. It looks like we got a little bit of finish checking right here. And moving on to the back, it's highly contoured back here. And the, that finish check line continues down there. Unfortunately, there's not a good headstock shot of this base. I think when this was initially listed, let's see how long ago was that? Yeah, a little over a year again. I think they had some on their website, but unfortunately I don't have them today. But we can at least see the volute and a really long headstock. I'm not sure how that neck takes that much tension, but apparently it does. And unfortunately we cannot see the Gibson logo, but I just vaguely remember it. But what I find kind of interesting here is it almost looks like an aftermarket modification. It wasn't, but look, you've got four large tuners right here. So that's like your standard four string bass. And then you've got, it almost looks like Grovers from the way I'm looking right here, but who knows what they were actually. So different size tuners to make it easier to know which one you're on. Kind of a cool idea. But what is even the story behind this? Because this shop definitely has some celebrities dropping by. So this used to belong to Tom Peterson of Cheap Trick. You know, Rick Nielsen, all that other good stuff. And the listing is the one that's claiming that it is the only 12 string bass Gibson has ever made. And I... I... I don't know, should Gibson make a production 12 string bass? It would definitely get people to talk about them. And then we have one last one to cover for Would You Rock or Not today. This is uh, one, I, I feel like I've talked about these enough. It didn't really deserve its own episodes. And those other two, they weren't quite long enough, but they were cool enough to share. But this one right here, take a look at this. So it appears we have gold hardware, triple pickups. That is that actually a gold piece as well, like reflective brass. And then we've got four speed knobs and a beautiful kind of a mild quilt slash flame top. That's kind of one of those slightly in between ones. And you're probably thinking, yeah, it looks nice, but why is it special enough to be featured today? Well, we've got to move on a little bit further here. Not seeing anything too special yet. Oh, <laughs> this is a pink widow over top of natural maple. So there's actually a slight hue of pink over top of that maple. You can see it right there along the binding. So I just thought that was kind of fascinating and interesting choice to be sure. I'm not sure if I really like that, but you know, it's kind of interesting enough to share anyways, but beautiful piece of mahogany right here. Lots of rings, lots of wood grain. And this kind of helps show off that light pink hue that's over top of it. You know, I bet this would be one of those guitars that would look better in person because then you'd be able to appreciate that pink hue a little bit more. From this angle, I'm going to call it a flame top though. Let's see, do they have any of by the neck? Unfortunately, they do not. And it's only billed as a Les Paul Custom F for a flame top or figure top. And it looks like it was potentially made in 2016. It's kind of a shame they didn't do the neck binding close up because that's going to be pink as well. Well, for our playing demo today, let's go ahead and check out a few samples of these style of instruments. <laughs> The only question left, which one of these guitars would you rock or not? Leave your answer down in the comment section below, 
don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.